Fantastic. Well, I'm glad that we're not super secret. Um, because we, of course, do think that Japan is one of the best kept secrets um, in the world. So don't tell everybody too much about the whole thing. Wonderful topic. Um, I mean, as you know, I've been you know around here for about 38 years, and uh, you've always been optimistic uh, on Japan. But there was this session at some point in the mid 1990s. And uh, I was drinking in Akasaka with a bunch of my politician friend. And uh, just before midnight, the old prime minister, ex-prime minister Nakasone, showed up. And so, you know, merry and doing all the wonderful things. And then finally, I mustered all my courage in my bad Japanese and sort of said, well, Mr. Nakasone, I mean, China is on the rise. Japan is going to, Japan is on the decline. What are you going to do about it? And so he grabbed a bottle of sake and poured a big round of drinks for everybody. And then he looked me in the eyes and he said, Jesper, we will keep doing what we're doing and wait for them to fuck it up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to use that word, but I thought after lunch you need a little bit of a waking up thing. And now Japan has arrived. Um, you know, Warren Buffett, um, you know, big investor, big advocate uh, of Japan. Um, you know, uh, last week was Japan Week uh, with Larry Fink and some of the biggest investors in the world all coming to Japan. So the question really is, um, what's different? Is it different this time? And I'm very glad that we've got this expert panel here. And I'm, uh, Takamori-san, I'm going to put you on the spot. Is it different this time? What is different from your experience? Well, hello. Uh, my name is Yuki Takemori. I'm, uh, I'm just an ordinary banker uh, of here, Development Bank of Japan. So um, I don't know why the uh, you know Mr. Jasper invited me here, just because I I, I said I said you know I'm uh, just uh, you know the banker. <laughs> so uh, with the uh, my business career for about uh, 30 years, um, the um, I'm uh, investing to the you know, various you know, customers, especially the manufacturing and engineering companies. And uh, 30 years, and uh, it's within the uh, 30 years, um, around the uh, 20, uh, within the uh, 30 years, uh, 20 years, I was, uh, you know, the investing to the especially heavy industry companies and aerospace, and aerospace, uh, you know, I was setting up uh, the some, you know, the startup company uh, like you know lunar you know, landing project or you know the small rocket programs. So I think in uh, Japan, is the within the uh, 30 years in business careers, I think uh, you know uh, not changing is very important. So the sustainability is, is means you know, ch not changing. So as is you know business uh, you know model is very important. So DBJ is also supporting to the you know uh, as is conditions uh, for about uh, you know 30 years. But recently, just only five years. So our banks is very little bit changing, and the board members uh, our customers are changing because uh, you know I I, I think uh, you know now is is not a answer to the you know five years later and you know, ten years later. So these uh, you know, board members, and of course, you know, including us, is saying that, uh, you know, for example, the carbon neutral is very important and the innovation is very important. But uh, you know, the business operation is not changing uh, uh, before the COVID, but after the COVID. So we should say the you know, change is very important. Real change is very important. Uh, so not only just you know, legacy operation, but also the startup and the, you know, innovation and technology. So the board members and our members is seeing the, uh, you know, what is the, uh, trigger uh, in order to change, in order to adapt to the you know, future changing. So that, that is my you know, rough feeling, sorry. Um, he's not just a banker. Uh, DBJ is the hub uh, of what Japan does, um, both here domestically and in the rest of the world. It's a wonderful organization because it's hybrid. Um, it is part of the government, yet it is also in it for the money. Uh, it is also for profit. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, whether it is in the startup world or whether it is in the long-term project finance world, um, you know, they are involved uh, everywhere. Can you give me, and so I'm going to put you on the spot, uh, can you give me one little anecdote? I mean, we all recognize, so business as usual is no longer an option. We have to change. Give me one anecdote, right, of where in your dinosaur of an organization, right, the change has actually happened. What has brought it home to you? <laughs> One episode. Well, I am um, having a long-term business within, uh, for example, heavy industries like uh, Mitsubishi or uh, IHI or Kawasaki. 
at the corporate finance to these uh, you know heavy industries, and uh, you know I um, uh, involved uh, you know heavily involved the you know, MRJ project is the you know uh, domestic you know um, uh, Mitsubishi regional jet is uh, you know with my you know the business carriers, and of course I you know we are. Uh, strongly financed to the end you know, rocket, huge rocket like uh, H2 and H3, for example. So that is a very, very legacy and it's very important business. But though, the some members is uh, in a spin off to the you know, some sort of you know, advanced air mobility like a sky drive. Is, yeah, we are seeing the you know, Saratobu Kuruma. Uh, this, uh, we, 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 could see, we, we could see the, uh, you know, uh, not only just uh, you know, the uh, set up young generation, but also the, you know, some you know, OB or you know, the senior guys from the Mitsubishi Heavies is joined. And I you know, cooperate with these you know, uh, you know, startup members and uh, these you know, senior guys. And uh, I think this uh, combination is very you know, good because you know, uh, advanced air mobility doesn't have any, you know, uh, graphic, uh, you know, how can I say, uh, uh, certification system in, in Japan because you know, uh, MRJ failed uh, to get the, uh, you know, the, uh, such a you know, regulation. But you know, uh, based on such an experiences and failing of the you know, uh, certification, now is the you know, government and uh, you know legacy and the young generation is in gathering and uh, with using the, uh, the SkyDrive as a tool to uh, get uh, you know the big you know, innovation and big, uh, big uh, breakthrough uh, to the uh, you know the new advance in mobility. So that is the you know the great uh, uh, give me the, some you know energy uh, to not only adjust in corporate finance but also the, you know combine these. You know, um, Great, I, I'm gonna say the combination uh, by using the, you know, uh, uh, in SkyDrive, uh, SkyDrive means in a startup as a tool, I think. Yeah. So it is interesting, is my, my favorite statistics on Japan at the moment uh, is the fact that practically one in four of the bureaucrats, of the elite bureaucrats who join METI, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health and Welfare, one in four now quits by the time they are 28, 29, which is you know, unheard of before. And what's exciting is when you ask, where do these people go? Do they go to JP Morgan or do they go to Mitsubishi Corporation? No, 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 three quarters of them actually go to a startup. So you know, the mobility of the labor market you know, certainly has changed a lot. Now, Andrew. From the excitement about startups, right? Um, you are a long-term investor um, in Japan. You've always been very, very focused on the value proposition in Japan. And you've also very, very proactively engaged with all of your portfolio companies. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've seen in public markets, right? Um, you know, with the change that, has, that is uh, going on in Japan. Sure, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Jesper. Um, by way of background, I was here, I, I came to Japan and worked for a Japanese company almost 30 years ago. Uh, I then went to the same investment bank of Jesper and, and spent some time in Hong Kong and China. And then I ended up working for a value investing firm in, in Tokyo and by accident was involved in a series of the activist transactions that became famous in the early 2000s, uh, Nippon Broadcasting, Olympus, um, Nippon Koa, Nico Cordial, and so on. Um, and I, I think to illustrate the change, I, I would say, very, first of all, very quickly, I think there's a generational change that um, <clears throat> everyone here River, on the media side, um, you know, the, a few months ago, BBC's analyst who had been f following Japan for 25 years left, and his final headline was, uh, Japan was the future, now it's the past. It was one of the most negative articles you've ever seen. He's been there here for 30 years. If you read River's work, it's very different. Um, at the corporate level, the executives that we inter interact with today are fed up with being um, patronized by investors because they feel, and I think rightly so, as, as Jesper has documented, that the, the operating performance of Japanese companies over the last 30 years stands up very well um, not just compared to their predecessors, but also compared to what's happened in the U.S. and, and Europe. Um, and I guess finally, um, and this is anticipating another question about what's different today than before, they're, they're technical factors. I was in Boston last week meeting with one of the most um, powerful consulting firms in Japan, in, in, the, in the institutional world, and I, I asked a question. I said, raise your hand if you've got more than 25% of your assets in, in Japanese equities. And I went down 15, 10, 5. 
And finally, one of them asked me a question, and he said, I don't know what we've got. You tell me what the allocation is to Japan and ACWI, and, uh, which is an index, and we're somewhere below that. And so the number is around 2% for many of these institutions. So they're coming to Japan, they're interested in Japan, but they haven't done anything yet. It can't go, you can't go below zero. And on the other side of the ledger, you've had this elimination of cross holdings, which have been a drag on the company, on, on Japanese, um, on, the, on the stock market for, for 30 years. That number's gone from 50% to, to 5%. And um, if may I tell my my story, my prop story, or should I tell your no. prop okay. story? We love props. I always bring pokies because they're delicious, uh, and they also illustrate, I think, one of the things that y Jesper's talked about so so eloquently, which is the increase in metabolism in Japanese companies. In 2005, the company that makes pokies, Izaki Glico, was a target of a Steel Partners um, activist campaign and my firm was the largest shareholder and we were courted by both the company and, and Steel Partners and we ended up selling our shares and going on. Um, Steel Partners blew up, their campaign failed, um, but 15 years later, the company had done everything that Steel and we and other shareholders wanted on their own. They'd gotten out of the sausage business, they doubled margins in their, their existing business, they've innovated, they've invested overseas and, and in that way, they resemble many other Japanese companies, uh, Cal, Calbi, uh, Morniaga. And so in that intervening 15-year period, we then go and meet with their peers, and the conversations are really much more fruitful. Um, we've, we've had CEOs ask us, we have now doubled our margins, we've got cash flow, what do you think we should do? And that happens up and down the portfolio um, in all sorts of ways that, that frankly have surprised me and that are very different from, I think, the narrative that we've been s told in the press, but which River is correcting. I mean, it, it is quite amazing, right? I mean, I, you know, there's Nihon wa kaikaku wa dame kaizen tokui, right? Japan doesn't do revolutions or you know radical change but this puts a puts a puts a puts a little bit better every time you know they're very good i mean you know eight years ago um the great ito commission came up with oh you got to have an roe of eight percent at the time it was around 3.9 percent and here we are you know throughout the COVID recession you know steadily eight eight and a half percent of uh, return on equity there now river um, you know, your engagement, you know, from the media side with Japanese corporations. Tell us a little bit about what, what do you sense, what are the aspirations, you know, of uh, the Japanese CEOs that, that, that you meet? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as, a, as a good reporter, I will refrain from giving my own opinion and merely repeat back to you what I hear from companies and from various investors, and I think you know, going back to the original question of is this time different, I think the first time I really realized or sort of felt that things are different this time around is I, I did a podcast actually earlier this summer on this very question of is Japan back? What is going on with the Warren Buffett investment? And um, maybe that was a mistake, but my inbox started kind of flooding in with requests from various investor groups in the U.S. saying, you know, I'm coming to Japan for the first time in two decades to meet with all of these companies. Um, you know, in the past, we've kind of reached out. We haven't gotten a whole lot of kind of uh, visibility into what operations are like on the ground. And so when you speak with these people, um, my first question to them is, you know, why is this on your radar now? And it really was from a bulk of them, it was Buffett's investment in Japan. Um, so, you know, their clients are coming to them and saying, I heard Warren say this, and, and what are you doing about it? Um, but I think what is interesting this time around is that they are really kind of pursuing dialogues with companies. Um, and as was just mentioned a few seconds ago, there's been a lot of kind of changes within Japanese corporations. I think they've been doing a lot to kind of work on share price and boost value in that sense, but they felt that they haven't been really recognized through that. So you get you know, CEOs at briefings saying, you know, we're doing this to boost our share value, X, Y, Z, but they don't feel like it's kind of really falling on, on investor ears, especially foreign investors, um, until quite recently. And so you know, with 
this kind of heightened attention on Japan at the moment, I think there's an opportunity uh, for there to be just more dialogue between companies and between foreign investors at the moment. Um, and they're in Japan, they're asking the questions. Um, I think an important point is that you know, a vast majority of listed companies in Japan are small cap companies that don't have a robust IR department that speaks fluent English. And um, But investors are very keen on kind of having one-on-one -on -one meetings with management and understanding them as people and are they, you know, collaborative? Are they interested in kind of taking uh, shareholder input? Um, so I think it's a great opportunity in that sense to have this attention and it can be, can be made more kind of long-term and sustainable if these dialogues prove fruitful? I mean, there's an openness. Um, there is, in my opinion, there's a willingness, um, you know, for the younger generation, the new generation of CEOs, uh, to actually tell their story um, and to actually create their own legacy. I mean, you know, over the last five years, the average age of a Japanese listed company CEO has dropped by 15 years. It's terrible. Now, now I'm feeling old. <laughs> uh, no, but it's, it's quite interesting that you have this. now. Change of tack, one of the things that obviously happened here in the world of finance and ultimately in the interest of economic efficiency, wow, the stock exchange is pointing the finger at you and says, hey, your price to book is below one. Explain yourself. What are you going to do about this? I mean, this is like nowhere in the world, right? Um, is the, t the stock exchange actually doing something like this? And as we know, about half, give or take, of the companies you know, are trading um, you know, at about half book. And you can calculate, by the way, if you all go to book value, right? the Nikkei will go to 40,000. Right? So there you go. You've got a little bit of a backstop here. But Andrew, to you, the, for you from, from, from the value investor's perspective, talk to me a little bit about this Tokyo Stock Exchange initiative and how, that's, how, how you evaluate that. I have mixed feelings about it um, because I don't think it's the place of the stock exchange or frankly the companies to, quote, do anything about where companies trade in the public markets. I think they can, and, and back to Warren Buffett, I mean, I think you know, he, rightly he says the, the, the market is, um, it's a psychotic. Sometimes it's happy and sometimes it's not. And, and one of the wonderful things, one of the good things about working with Japanese companies as opposed to U.S. companies over the last 25 years is that um, Japanese CEOs have focused primarily on making good products that please their customers and taking care of their employees and their communities. And U.S. executives, in my experience, have focused increasingly exclusively on the share price. And, and so I think that broadly, as Kishida-san goes to America and tries to make Japan an asset management company, as private equity companies come here and try to do to Japan what they have done to America, I think that whole, we need to be very careful about focusing on price as opposed to generating value. Um, I think it would be better if, I, I like the Ito approach, which was the approach of an owner, which is we need to get our returns on equity up. Because as we've told, as I've had many conversations with these, these CEOs, they've said, well, what do you want me to do? I've, I've doubled my earnings. I've increased my returns. I'm buying back shares. It's kind of the market's problem to value it. Now, with that said, I think that it was pushing through an open door because coming out of COVID, as we mentioned, a lot of Japanese companies um, were very conservative about their balance sheets. They held on to cash. They held on to employees. Um, their earnings are very strong, and I think they've just, they're acting rationally, realizing they have to compete for people and realizing they have to compete for capital. And so that low price to book is a problem for these companies as well. And I, and I think it's just, it's, it's not so much an impetus to change as, a rec as, as just one other f sign of, of rationality amongst um, the people in Japan who realize we've got to fix what's going on in this island because no one's going to help us. Uh, we've got everybody else in the world focused on themselves. We need to take action. It's actually very interesting. I mean, the TSE launched officially on April 1st this initiative. And, uh, you know, they've gotten, uh, you know, positive response in terms of we are actually going to do something about it. 
from around 40%, don't quote me on the exact numbers, it's, it's there about, on four, or from about 40% of the companies. And then basically um, sort of the remaining sort of 60% of the companies, well, one third didn't respond. Uh -huh. And uh, the other one third that did respond, and they're, they're not gonna do anything about it, very interestingly, they were companies where predominantly there was a large majority share owner. Right? So it was actually an old family, you know, a family type legacy business that actually didn't want to change, right? And wanted to keep things going the way things are going. Takemori san, as 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 a banker, right? Um, and, and you're very international. Um, you know, in, in no no yes you are. You know where Kansai is. So, so, <laughs> um, no, he's very international, um, you know, but, but like, you know, from, from, from a banker's perspective and maybe, you know, if you can put on your DBJ's hat perspective, you know, how, how do you, how do you uh, uh, look at the, the Tokyo Stock Exchange initiatives and that sort of the developments in corporate finance here in Japan? Well, um, as you mentioned, the, uh, I'm just an uh, you know, ordinary banker, so um, I don't have any you know, knowledge of the uh, you know, analysis in the Tokyo stock, stock Exchange market. So Tokyo Stock Exchange market is recovering. But I uh, you know as I uh, discuss with my colleagues in my bank, so just uh, you know recovery is the, uh, just only uh, back into the normal uh, after the uh, uh, before the uh, you know the uh, COVID. That's all. So just back back to the normal, and uh, plus uh, maybe uh, you know uh, Wei Yang uh, led the uh, you know global you know investors uh, to be uh, in a strong position to the you know, uh, Japanese market. And that's all I think. But um, uh, to be to be honest, uh, you know that's a little bit little, little bit different. Where it's, it's the you know, for example, um, you know, um, restructuring, restructuring, you know, how can I say the restructuring, the lack of human resources. So we can see we can see the, a lot of you know, human the lack of human resources in the, in the company. But um, you know the legacy. I, I think it's a little bit changing. So the legacy company, like uh, you know, uh, how can I say the Honda or the others. So some engineers is uh, you know. And the great, uh, you know, they are, um, how can I say, they're good business in the you know, Honda, for example. And maybe in you know, a Honda corporate uh, is, you know, stop to the, you know, uh, quitting the, uh, uh, you know, uh, running away from the, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the, uh, from the Honda. So the thing as is, uh, you know, um, human resources. And, uh, you know, legacy is, uh, you know, protecting the human resources. And uh, a startup is the, uh, you know, of course, you know, getting getting the human resources. Of course, you know, there is there needs the yeah, more, you know, the human resources. So it means a you know, lack of human resources. But uh, now is the, uh, you know, um, a few few years ago, uh, Japanese legacy is attacking to the new business and new innovation like a startup. But now is the very very, you know, how can I say, the corporate with the, uh, you know, their startup, uh, not only just acquiring, but also they, you know, uh, expanding their business. Uh, we are use, with using the you know, startup. So that is the reason that uh, you know, fluidity for human resources from the you know, uh, legacy company to the startup is a very you know, smoothly, I think. So that is uh, you know, one of the restructuring of the uh, you know, their big company, the legacy company. So I think it's such kind of a, you know, how can I say, oh, um, so smoothly shifting from the legacy to the you know, startup, from the legacy to the, uh, you know, the new business is very important, not uh, a pressure to the you know, restructuring. So the, these are, uh, needs a little bit of time uh, compared to the United States, like in five years and 10 years. But uh, you know, slowly shifting is here, and uh, this is a fact. So we're, uh, in, as a banker, you know, as a finance uh, should uh, make, uh, you know, uh, of course, you know, we have the, you know, you know, boss of, you know, the network with the you know, legacy and the startup. So maybe you know, we're, uh, you know, as a you know, catalyst, so, uh, you know, accelerating to the, you know, shifting to these, you know, uh, the startup and innovation company from the legacy because you know, we are the uh, big financers to the you know, uh, legacy and the both, 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 both of you know, legacy and the startup. So, that is my so, so changing the internal innovation model, right? Where you had, you were Toshiba, you were Hitachi, you were Fujitsu, you were Asahi Glico. You know, you had your researchers, you had your R&D departments, you did this stuff and then it came up, you know, from your own line, you didn't acquire it from the outside. So, you know, you, this model slowly but surely, you know, there's now an openness, um, you know, that uh, that is actually changing. River, do you observe that in your dealings with the with the companies here in Japan that there is a new openness for where innovation comes from internally or externally? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think you know we touched upon kind of 
it, during the early months of the pandemic or the early you know year of it, I think there was a lot of kind of disruptions when it came to supply chain logistics, and then demand for Japanese products you know bounced back significantly because there had been a focus, as Andrew mentioned, on you know these quality products that Japan's exporting. I think exports were up something like 20% last year. And so there are kind of robust earnings coming from companies at the moment. And um, you see pretty massive acquisitions um, in recent years. You know, I'm thinking of Panasonic, Hitachi. Um, there's been a lot of kind of spending on areas of Japanese companies where I think they felt they were lagging in the past. So a lot of people call last year the, the year of kind of digital uh, transformation acquisitions, um, companies buying software companies in the U.S., for example. Um, so there is kind of, I, I sense a strong openness on, you know, companies to look externally, um, not even within Japan, to kind of build this prowess um, and then, of course, kind of integrate it with their own existing ways to, to create a unique uh, product out of all of that. Um, yeah. I wanted to add to that that that's another change that I've seen. I think Japanese companies have gotten better in M&A uh, from a very low base. They were terrible 10 years ago, whether it was the um, Monty, the, the Indian Dynapun Pharmaceutical or Kirin's acquisitions in, in Latin America. Terrible deal after terrible deal. And, but more recently, if you, if you look at, for example, Hitachi's acquisition of Global Logic, which is an Indian IT business, primarily. It's been integrated extremely well, much to my surprise. Um, and it's what, co what Japanese companies are running up to uh, against, frankly, is the human resources problem that you mentioned. But they've become more global. Japan is the largest investor in the U.S., has been for the last three years in, in the Imperial Hotel. Right now, there's a southeastern U.S. Japan conference going on to, to, to really celebrate 40 years of this co-investment. But the number of Japanese who are willing to spend time overseas studying English and is declining. And, and I think that there's a willingness to integrate companies, but the real challenge is managing them. And I, I, that is something, I think, that me, where the government can help because it, it gets back to education, visa, and, and that sort of thing. If there is, you know, from your perspective, you know, sort of switching the tables for 30 seconds, um, you know, what... Can, Jap can American CEOs, American leaders, learn from Japanese CEOs? Everything. <laughs> One of the most disappointing articles I've read in the journal this year is the, the profile of this Doug Calhoun, the CEO of, of Boeing, who knows a lot more about riding in airplanes than, than buying them, than building them, rather. And, and as, as many of you know, uh, Japan now produces 37% of the parts in a Boeing um, advanced airframe. The US is led primarily by financial engineers, whether they're in private equity or public equity. Um, they don't know anything about actually building or making anything. Japanese companies, and I'll use Hitachi as an example, the most recent CEO at Hitachi, he's an engineer. I mean, every one of our companies is run by an individual who knows how to do whatever it is the company does. It's, it's a Shohei Otani model. They're, really, they're better at the American game than the Americans are. And they're playing by the same rules that the Americans have. They just work hard, they have humility, and they ha they've earned the respect of their teammates. They haven't overpaid themselves. So I think managing companies the way American companies used to do things, which is the way Japanese companies do them now, and it's always been the case. If you want to lead, you first have to know how to do. And I think Americans can learn that from Japan. Takemura-san, I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry. What do, what, what, if, if you have to advise an American CEO, what can they learn? Advice? <laughs> so oh, many. Sorry. No, I, I don't have any advice. Sorry. But uh, I, 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 got, I got to remember, the, um, uh, I was working with an aerospace business for uh, 20 years. And uh, at the end of 2015, I met with the uh, uh, CEO of uh, you know, GE company and have the, you know, some introduction from the GE additive manufacturing uh, uh, from the CEO. It's, uh, I was very excited and uh, I am very you know, introduced to the, this you know, concept to the you know, uh, domestic uh, you know, Japanese company. Almost the Japanese companies are very interested in the you know, GE, uh, GE additive, of course, but that's all. 
But though, uh, around 10 years ago, uh, Japanese you know, board members uh, getting the advice from the consultant or at the other, you know, some sort of, uh, I'm not sure, just banker, investors, uh, with an, uh, you know, high, uh, you know, expensive, uh, you know, adv advice fee. So uh, do, doing the you know, M&A, not, 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 uh, no, no relation with the you know, co-competence of the you know, company. And now, uh, is an additive, for example. So these guys, uh, you know, want to protect the you know, casting. They are, you know, casting, you know, the manufacturing. But uh, now, is, uh, you know, in order to get more uh, efficient, you know, uh, how can I say, the process. So that this uh, additive is very important. And, uh, you know, there is no additive, you know, the uh, business in India, in Japan. But, uh, you know, the new material, the technology, is, the science is, is here. And the additive manufacturing is in the United States, so combining. So the thing that I want to say is that you know, the board members is fine the, you know, with, without you know, consulting advice. So they are looking for what, what is the you know, competence and combination uh, between the, with the United States and uh, you know, the Japan. So uh, I, I think directly these guys are, you know, directly come to the you know, US and have a you know, direct talk. You know, maybe you know, it's getting a more reality, uh, not, not uh, just a textbook. So that is a very, very you know, important point, I, I think. No, it's interesting. Let me pivot. Um, one of the most interesting conversations I had this year was with Kengo Kuma, the architect. Right? So we were just shooting the breeze and said, hey, Kengo, what's the most interesting thing you're doing right now? And I was fully expecting some billion dollar skyscraper in Dubai or something like that. Right? He said, no, Hokkaido. Hokkaido? Yeah, 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 there's this, um, you know, family from Kentucky that, uh, you know, is fifth generation whiskey distillery, and they have bought one of those old schools, you know, the high schools, because there's no more kids, right? They bought one of these old high schools, and they are turning this into a distillery and a little luxury boutique hotel, a destination thing, and that's my most interesting project. <laughs> Kingo, why, my God, Hokkaido already has a thousand hotels, you know, but, but you know, no, 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 yes, but you, you, you do not understand. They're making a business decision because they figured out if they can distill whiskey in Hokkaido and print on it made in Japan, it will sell at a 40% premium, right, to the Asian consumer market. Onshoring. I mean, there's obviously this hello, we got to be independent from China on our semiconductor supply chains, but sort of genuine onshoring, right? Recommitting productive capital here in Japan. River, you know, I hope you've been to Kumamoto. Uh, and tell us a little bit about the, 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 the excitement and the pains around uh, onshoring or French shoring or, you know, Japan is back. Yeah, I think a big question, I mean, on all, you know, management levels, minds that you speak to at the moment is, is U.S., China. Um, there's a big sense that, you know, people are moving towards block economies and how does Japan kind of fit within that? Is it benefiting? Is it losing? And it's definitely not kind of a black and white story. But in general, I think... Um, there's been a lot of kind of opportunities uh, within Japan because it is kind of looked at as a non-China within Asia. Um, you know, I'm thinking of a kind of striking moment earlier this year when the G7 was being held in Japan and the Nikkei was hitting, you know, a 30-year high. At the same time, leaders in the other room were saying, you know, we're not uh, decoupling from China, but we're de-risking from China. Um, and I don't, and I think those two are, are correlated. Um, even going back to some of the conversations I've been having with U.S. investors visiting Japan at the moment, uh, you know, they have a certain amount that they want invested in Asia right now, and they don't feel as comfortable kind of investing in China-related businesses. And Japan, of course, is a democracy, a U.S. ally, so it seems kind of more stable in that sense. Um, I think also it's drawn a lot of investment in J Japan recently. We see Micron investing in semiconductor plants, uh, TSMC investing in semiconductor plants in Japan. Um, and, you know, a lot of these kind of growing arenas, uh, think semiconductors, batteries, um, there's a lot of components in those that are actually, you know, coming out of Japan and where they would have faced more kind of competition with China a uh, story we wrote in the journal earlier this year, um, we were looking at BMW, they were trying to get a specific type of kind of cylindrical battery for their car, and they had always, they'd sourced from China, it was more com uh, com competitive when it comes to costs, but because of the risks there, they actually started um, entering into conversations with Panasonic, 
Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for Japan in this sense. Of course, um, maybe it's perhaps a Goldilocks moment where the more kind of, you know, uh, polarization there is between those countries, uh, then there'll be blowbacks further down the line. But um, it's certainly kind of, I, I think, top of mind for management, at least as I see today. May I jump in on Kumamoto? I want to, I want to <laughs> highlight something, Sorry, a name Kumamoto. that you did not <laughs> mention though, and and that was um, Toshiba Semiconductor, mm -hmm. most notable in the last five years of incredible. Um, investment in semiconductor capacity has been the absence of Toshiba Semiconductor. And this is a company that invented NAND memory and has 0% of the high bandwidth memory that now SK Hynix, Micron, and, um, and Samsung control. And I, I think that is a warning to those of us, including myself, who looked to private equity as the answer to a lot of Japan's problems. Um, Toshiba Memory is the most levered company in the semiconductor industry thanks to what Bain considers its most successful buyout in Asia. Um, and that has been an enormous success for the investors at Bain. Um, Bain brought in a guy named Stacy Smith to manage the company at Toshiba. Um, Stacy Smith was passed over at Intel, and rightly so, for Pat Gelsinger. Stacy Smith, like the head of GE, or like the head of um, Boeing, started out in GE's finance department. Um, and the levered financial model that has been used um, at Toshiba has materially damaged Japan's technical ability at a time when it's not just economically important, but, but strategically important. And so I think when we look at this private equity model, you, you talk about Davos. Um, Davos, how do you pronounce it? Is it Davos? It was Davos. It was the head of Bain who was representing investors. And he said to uh, Gideon Richmond, he said, well, we are prepared to do in Japan what we do everywhere else. And I, and I think we should be very thoughtful and really, really careful about that because thank goodness America has Japan to rely on and for all these things that you've been doing at the DBJ in terms of technical capacity. If we'd followed the financial engineering model, we would not have that. And the best example of that is Toshiba um, and what they're not doing in Kumamoto. Um, fantastic. Please start to think about your question. Um, you know, one final question from me, um, you know, to the panel. Um, if you had the proverbial two minutes with the prime minister, Right? So things are going well. Japan is having its little moment. There's genuine change. You know, um, but you know, on the sort of rules, regulation, or even on the sort of corporate culture uh, side, right? If you had sort of you know, one or two things, well, let's make it one thing, right, that you would like to see changed, what, what, what would it like to be? Yes. you. Um, simply uh, protection structure uh, to the technology. So, for example, I, uh, DBJ, as uh, one of the shareholder uh, investor to the Toshiba, uh, of course, you know, I'm very you know, proud of uh, you know, the collaborating with the Toshiba company as a corporate finance basis. But, as, for example, the semiconductors. So, still it's strong, the semiconductor, but a little bit, to be honest, uh, you know, the, it's a little bit you know, the not, not good position uh, in this uh, semiconductor in Japan. So the reason, I, I'm not sure the reason wh why, but uh, you know, for example, the battery and uh, you know, semiconductors uh, originally is very strong. But uh, you know, uh, lo looking carefully uh, as a, you know, the uh, ground basis, so the human resource is a very, very you know, highly flexible uh, to the, uh, you know, not only Japan, but also the China or the other you know, countries. So human resource is very important. So now is the, uh, you know, the look looking, watching the, uh, some sort of in history, for example, the quantum computing, for example, so there, there is a very you know, strong you know, uh, humans uh, in this uh, not only university, but also the national research, national, national research, you know, research uh, you know, institutions. So we should protect these you know, quantum computing, the basic science, I think. So, but uh, you know, these you know, guys, it's very, very, you know, how can I say, uh, honestly, uh, explanation, their you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, study in, in front of the not only, not only uh, not, uh, China, but not, not the uh, US, but uh, China. So I think uh, you know, such kind of uh, you know, shifts you know, matter in the United States. So for, 
uh, investors are a little bit restricted to the you know, investment in the United States, the CPUs in you know, clearance in the U US. Like uh, we need uh, such kind of a similar, you know, the, uh, you know, the regular protection, the technology uh, in, in Japan. So that, that is uh, the key word, I, I would say. I mean, this, this, sorry, I will give you another example on this. I mean, the Japan's intellectual property rules and regulations and the way it's handled at the university level is a disaster. Um, and I'm on the board of one of these tech universities and one of the Japanese universities there, you know, somebody making a very, very good, promising little innovation in material sciences, right? And so he went to the public universities uh, department and said, well, I need some intellectual property protection around the whole thing. And they said, well, here is uh, goju mayen, right? 50,000, uh, what was it, $5,000. Yeah, right. is it? Yes, well, whatever. Uh, um, you know, uh, here's $5,000, the equivalent, and you can, you can get a, a, a little patent protection. And then, this is idiotic, you know, in the sense of that, that this gives you protection here in Japan, but you need this everywhere in the world. You need a package deal. And whether it's $50,000 or whether it's $100,000, whatever it costs, that system just needs to be established here. Now, Andrew, for you, your two minutes with the Prime Minister. Long term, we need more rivers, more shoheis, more keikos. They are all bilingual, bicultural. They spent time educationally overseas, so quantum physics, the head of the president of Keio University, has a, C, a PhD from Caltech and is a leader in quantum computing. We need more young Japanese spending time in US universities and vice versa, or we're not gonna have the people necessary to run the trade, defense, business um, entities that are being formed right now by our generation, which was educated at a time before US educational institutions were totally focused on China and totally de-emphasized Japan. Uh, short term, I would say break the stranglehold that the big three brokers have on the in investment community because Nomura, Daiwa, and, um, and Nikko have been a cancer for the domestic investment industry. They're the least, um, the, the, if you want to find someone who's down on Japan, who doesn't believe in Japan, go to the big three brokers. They spent the last 30 years selling Japanese domestic investors everything but Japanese equities. Um, on the other hand, the GPIF and the, and the PFA have just done wonderful work, and that's the model we need to, to open up to domestic investors so they can believe in investing in their home market in the same way that I do. Um, there is hope. Um, the FSA, I think it's public information, yes. I think the FSA is setting up a new, um, not study group, but, uh, you know, um, an actual group that will come up with legislative proposals, um, you know, for the asset management industry. And not a single Japanese uh, asset manager is part of that uh, group. So that's going to be quite interesting to actually see um, how that's, um, that's going on. River, your two minutes with the Prime Minister. Yeah, I think it. Uh, and, and you can't ask him. A, yes, you can ask him a question. Oh, <laughs> well, it most definitely will happen. But um, yeah, I think I agree. You know, the the big issue that both of um, these gentlemen brought up, human resources, is a huge issue. Um, I remember, you know, just in 2019, we wrote a story um, about kind of foreign workers in Japan and the the trainee program, um, and the the main character that we spoke to this. Uh, for this story was a Filipino nurse working at an elderly care facility in Japan. Um, and she, you know, moved here, her children were back in the Philippines, and she had two years to, to spend in Japan and then take a very kind of rigorous medical knowledge test in Japanese. And if she didn't pass it, then essentially she would be kicked out of the country. Um, and I think just over the past three years, you've seen pretty enormous changes in policy. I'm thinking specifically in June, opening up you know 12 different industries to workers, their families to stay here, you know, um, at least uh, on paper uh, as long as they want. Um, so I think Japan is moving in the right direction in that sense. Um, I think there needs to be about almost eight million foreign workers in the Japanese economy by 2040 if the country is going to meet its growth strategies. And so a lot of the conversations that we've been having about, you know, is Japan back? Is this time kind of going to last? Uh, it always, it, 
the end of the conversation always is, okay, yes, this is all great, but what about the demographic issues? What's going to happen in Japan in the long run in that sense? And so I think more progress, more opening up um, is what I would give my two minutes of advice to the Prime Minister on. <laughs> um, I've just checked the data. Uh, for the first six months of this year, uh, if you annualize this, um, you know, Japan is running at 258,000 uh, immigrants uh, coming into the country. In the year before COVID, it was about 180,000. Um, you know, this is quite enormous. Uh, by the way, China still is a net immigrant economy. Um, nobody really quite wants to go there, apart from maybe the German soccer team that should be banished there. Um, no, but, um, you know, so the change here is very real. Um, 7 and I, the convenience store company, uh, in April this year sold its first franchise to a gaijin. Um, and it is a Nepalese woman who arrived in Japan on a Mombusho scholarship 11 years ago. Um, she's married to a Nepalese. Um, she worked Arbaito, and she is now the first gaijin franchisee. And 7i actually has a whole program, because they've figured out, just on very pragmatic business analysis, that today, 11% of their staff are non-Japanese. But by 2030, which is practically around the corner, it will be more than 50%. And they've created this entire ecosystem of providing loans, of providing language education, visa support, et cetera, et cetera, to actually make this happen. So politics, ironically, may actually be lagging for what actually goes on because Japanese leaders are very, very pragmatic. Now, questions. Anybody here? Ha! The hands are flying up. Good. Piggy. Piggy. Yes, but you mentioned in the first session the age, average age in Japan. And Japan has been leading in elderly care. If you look at the demographics around the world, also in Europe, you see an enormous need for investments in that area. Those that are 70 plus control 70% of the economy. You are leading in thriving in the How will you develop new export products in elderly care from Japan? All right, next question. Let's just do it simple. Thank you very much. As, this is more to Andrew. I want to know, uh, we talk about ESGs today. Uh, I want to know your views on impact investing in Japan and how it will change Japan's venture capital and environment from now on. Great, and pass the mic to your back. Thank you very much. And what will, what will we require for Japanese people, uh, Japanese countries, to attract talents from all over the world. The Japan is facing the shortage of labor. Labor market is shrinking, but this is not only for Japan. Asian countries also are focusing the, to, to get the good talents. So Japan is, uh, Japan is to compete with other countries as well. Great, excellent. Andrew, do you want to give a track with the ESG? Yeah, it's my least favorite topic. I think it's a giant scam. Um, with that said, if you care about the environment, Japan is far and away the most carbon efficient economy in the world. If you care about society, walk around Tokyo and then go, as I did, to Boston, San Francisco, New York, um, Chicago. It has, as, as Jesper has shown, more than any other economy, it has shared the fruits equally amongst its, its, its people. Um, that is, for people who are serious about ESG, that's important. And if you care about governance, I mean, it's, it's the number of times I have investors say they're not investing in Japan because of the governance. I, I always ask them, okay, so where are you investing? And invariably, they're happy to invest in China. They're happy to invest in U.S. tech companies. And just, you know, if you watch We Crash, watch anything that SoftBank has invested in, and, and the, the governance has got that's one giant change over the last 20 years. The governance in the U.S. has just gotten a lot worse. So I don't think that you need to do anything special in Japan to create impact or ESG uh, to achieve those goals. I think it happens organically uh, for all the wonderful reasons that, that Jesper talks about in terms of what makes capitalism work in Japan. On the immigration question, River Takamori-san, attracting talent. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of very important question going forward is, I think, you know, 
uh, as I mentioned a bit ago, uh, for a long time, I think the, the, the attention was on, you know, foreigners want to come work in Japan, but Japan was not quite sure, you know, how, to what extent they wanted to receive them. Now they very much kind of realize, I think, that they, they need them, um, but it's a, it's an issue, I think, in a lot of cases of wages. I mean, in a lot of uh, parts in Japan, especially with the yen where it is right now, like minimum wage is, what, $7. And so um, for a lot of the segments within the Japanese economy that are going to be lacking in, in workers uh, over the decades ahead, um, there needs to be wage increases to create an environment where it's actually attractive for people to want to, to keep coming to Japan. Well, yes, uh, it uh, might be a very you know, important the issues, but um, I, I think you know, uh, I, I'm I'm sorry to say that uh, the, uh, a lot of uh, uh, the startup, so startup uh, is the uh, not only uh, just an innovation the vehicle, but also the how can I say the innovation for human resources. I think so. For example, the, my father is the uh, around the 80 years. He's a very very fine and very strong, stronger than me. I think so. Um, not, not, not need that care. So the, the, and he's uh, doing the everything, uh, and he's he's uh, doing the everything. So, for example, the uh, some sort of in the senior of the Mitsubishi is uh, moving to the um, uh, uh, startup, uh, you know, a sky drive, and uh, he's uh, in the key person, key engineer uh, of the, uh, in the in the business. Uh, he's a very you know, good relation with a very very younger guys, like uh, twenty and thirty years. So eighty years guys are very you know familiar, uh, very, very you know good relation with uh, twenty and thirty years. Not only uh, just you know Mitsubishi heavies, but also the uh, you know some sort of a uh, uh, like uh, you know Panasonic uh, senior guys uh, around the eighty years is coming to the uh, water reuse uh, you know uh, startup company. So the, uh, they are you know teaching so some uh, some of the efficiency in the product production you know the line for example. So this is uh, a sharing uh, between the uh, you know. Uh, high growth, uh, you know, uh, the uh, 80 and the 70s, uh, you know, the Jap Japanese and good, good relation and a uh, good, good timing, good time, and uh, you know, the younger generation. Such kind of you know, combination is very important. So that is a reason that I set up more in you know, a startup or in the, you know, how can I say, um, uh, incubation uh, to uh, to mix the you know, younger generation and the senior generation. So I think uh, you know this is uh, one of the uh, solution to the immigrant immigration. For example, the legacy is a little bit hesitant to you know, accept an immigrant, but uh, you know such uh, you know uh, you know uh, you know the startup is a very you know uh, you know not, not so hesitant to the, you know accept the, uh, some you know an immigration like an ice space in you know the uh, lunar you know learning programs is um, uh, around you know seventy percent is uh, uh, you know come from the you know, global the market. So that's kind of a, you know new you know the business model is a very important I think. So it's very interesting on the immigration side. Um, you know, I mean, it's not just about money. It's about a career path, right? And I mean, Japanese companies are filled with process, filled with little escalators that you have to climb on and just stand still. Just, just don't screw it up, right? And you will just sort of move up. Well, that's not the way a German, sorry. It's not the way an American works. That's not the way a young uh, woman from Jakarta who is ambitious works. I did the calculation, which is wonderful. In the 1960s, if you and I joined one of the Fortune 50, one of the Keiran-ran companies here in Japan, it took us 13 years to become bucho, right, general manager. Today, it takes you 24 years, right? So money is one thing, but you know, it's not just Gen Z. It's just human nature. I want responsibility. I want a meaningful job. I don't just want to do the photocopying and doing the kaban mochiing, right, for little Edai Shacho, right? So it's quite interesting. And to me, the most bullish sign of change is that one of Japan's dinosaurs, oh, I apologize. Is there anybody here from NTT? One of Japan's dinosaurs has a new CEO, and from the 1st of April, he's introduced Seika Shugi. So it's no longer, right, um, your seniority-based pay. You actually will get an, uh, an ability to be promoted, right, um, you know, into the next year. A sharp break with the sort of uh, traditional culture. And I think that, you know, how to attract that, you know, ambitious person from Jakarta, Right? Be they a man, be they a woman, that ambitious person from Mumbai, right? It is exactly the, the, the career paths, right, where Japanese corporations have more to do. On the healthcare thing, we'll talk afterwards over a strong glass of Aquavit. Yes, but let me add one thing on the, on the career path. I do want to point out that Japan has experience in this because if you look at their domestic 
operations in the U.S. Japan employs over, a, they've created a million manufacturing jobs in the U.S. and those are highly sought after. And in my home state of Tennessee, Denso has been there for 40 years. They have somehow in their overseas operations created that career path for, and, and they've trained people. I mean, there was no automotive industry in Tennessee 40 years ago. And so somehow they can do it. It's merging the two operations offshore and onshore that seems to be the challenge. Sorry, if I can add on that, there's, I've had a little pet project <clears throat> that we're trying to engage the government with, right? You can actually learn from Germany. Little known fact, 60% of all the Gastarbeiter, of all the immigrant workers, right, actually leave to go home, right? But they leave with a Meister. They leave with a certificate, right? So you become a plumber, you become a carpenter, you become one of these jobs that AI cannot fix, you know, because your plumbing is not gonna be fixed by an AI, trust me. Your plumbing, you're gonna need somebody who actually shows up and knows what he or she is doing. So the Germans have this Meister certificate, right? Where you know you go to school two or three times a, a, a month, right? And after two or three years, you actually get a certificate. Then you go back to Turkey or you go back to, um, you know, wherever it is that you're coming from, you are credit worthy, right? You can go home and start a business. And there's actually a German program that gives you Coxa Enjo, some development aid support that you get credit. And that way Germany actually creates a million um, you know, ambassadors, um, you know, in Turkey. Anyway, sorry, but it, it you know, there, so there are, there are, you know, creative ways. It's not about kitsui kitanai kiken. It's not about the dirty stuff, right? Oh, we get the, we get the foreigners to do the cheap construction work. It's not about that. I need a career path, and I need the option. If I want to stay in Japan, I can stay in Japan. That's perfectly fine. But if I want to go home, I actually have a little certificate that makes me credit worthy, that gives me access, right, and allows me to actually start a little enterprise. That's how Japan is going to become the model economy of the world. Any other question? Hi, sorry. We, we, yep, please, you too. Maybe a very quick question. Uh, in your view, how do you see Japan's economy next year, the outlook of Japan's economy? Why we you know, are facing some challenges from the foreign exchange or from the very low salary rate, also from the inflation? Um, so how will we see us next year? Okay, I'll take the, the next one. I'm actually incidentally a professor and researcher in semiconductor engineering and close to quantum computing at a national Japanese university. So my question is if we really want semiconductor industry to be, again, a strength of Japan, we need investment not only at company level, but also in universities and fundamental research. So I'd like to hear the panelists' perspective on this. And one more is uh, who should invest in this? Is it the government, is it the industry, or is it banks? Okay, very quickly. Thank you, excellent question. I'll give a two second answer to both of them. Um, <clears throat> on the economy, I think Weta san is gambling with the hard earned savings of the Japanese people and playing with fire. I think that contrary to common belief, the monetary policy of the BOJ is a disaster. It's not a reason, it's not a good thing for Japan, it's a terrible thing. And so I think the answer to your question will depend a lot on how quickly he realizes that gigantic mistake. Um, negative real rates always lead to bad investment allocation. Um, on semiconductor investing, I have challenged some of the endowments in the US to take a billion dollars that they right now have invested in Chinese venture capital firms and turn that and give it to their engineering departments and say, find a way to work with Japan to monetize the incredible basic research that for the reasons that Jasper mentioned are, um, are not monetized and in the bargain create this human capital exchange that we all need. Uh, so far there have been no takers on that idea because people like me like to stand between the ideas and uh, the money and collect a big fee. So I, th I think that it should be at the university level and it should be directly given to your departments and you should get a stake in it so that you can go out and do great things and invite us over for very nice dinners. 
uh, within the uh, 30 years uh, my banker's business career. So I've never experienced it, this such kind of uh, inflation and uh, interest rate increasing. So I've never experienced such a situation. So, um, you know, uh, the bankers is saying that, you know, th th this is the first experience. So what happened next years? So I think, uh, you know, the changing itself is, uh, you know, real, I, I think. So for example, the, how can I say the in, in English, but a zombie company is maybe I should be dead, or uh, the reality is, uh, you know, I survive. I think uh, under such kind of, uh, you know, inflation and uh, you know, interest rate increasing, maybe, uh, you know, changing itself. So we should adapt or we should, how can I say, catch up with, or we should do something in this and uh, changing, I think. Yeah. River? Well, we're in the negative red right now, but um, I, I think the, the semiconductor <laughs> was given a good answer by you. Um, and in terms of the economy next year, yes, I think the, the interest rates and, and um, inflation is, is a huge <laughs> question mark going forward. Uh, on a corporate sense, I think, you know, um, Things seem still seem pretty robust. I think. I mean, obviously, with the yen, where it is, it is benefiting companies, uh, especially exporters. Um, automobiles are, you know, when earnings come back to Japan in yen terms, they're they're doing quite well, uh, and they're spending that on an, on a kind of pivotal moment in time where they need to be making investments in the future. Um, so I think corporate is, is generally pretty robust. If I would add a slight kind of a <laughs> cheery note to what you said earlier, Andrew. Thank you very much. Just very quick answer to that. Um, you know, Kishida-san is the world's most boring prime minister. And the reason is that he isn't doing anything radical. He talks a lot, he takes a lot of notes, and here and there there's some little minor changes, but there's nothing big. There's no shock that's being introduced to the system. And the same, for better or for worse, is what's going on at the Bank of Japan. And so the irony is that the single biggest driver of change, right, in my personal opinion, is actually the fact that you do have inflation now. Because inflation kills the zombie companies. Because if you don't have a better product, if you don't have invested in more productive capital stock, and I don't care whether you're a hotel or whether you're a semiconductor factory, you are going to start to die. And it's nice, when you look, my favorite chart, Japanese bankruptcies from the 1960s, until the 19, until early 1990, bankruptcies rose. And then, despite the fact that the bubble collapsed and we had a lost generation, so to speak, bankruptcies actually fell throughout the entire time. And what's exciting is the fact that over the last nine months, bankruptcies are starting to increase. And that frees up resources, that frees up the zombie companies, that is painful for those people who do get laid off from those companies, but they do actually find that they, if they raise their hand, if they're prepared to do a little bit of reskilling, that they can actually find a job very, very quickly. So the metabolism here in Japan is very much up, and as a result of that, you're not bullish enough on Japan. Thank you very much. A phenomenal pa panel here. Um, thank you very, very much. And uh, you've been a fantastic audience, and uh, we see you at the dance party tonight.